Hi, Talaya. Thank you so much for coming to the show. I really appreciate it. How are you doing today? I am good. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah, you're most welcome. And the pleasure is mine to bring you as a guest in this show. And you have like a really, really interesting story to tell. And also like you had really hard uh, journey you had through in the last few years as well. Mm -hmm. So before we get to like talk about your company and everything, like how you help others, I want to know more about your journey overcoming cancer. So how old are you when you got uh, your diagnosed with the cancer? Yes, I was in my early 30s when I was diagnosed. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in corporate America, doing all the things that society tells us we're supposed to be doing. So at that time, you know, I was trying to climb the corporate ladder, yeah. thinking about starting a family, all those things. My diagnosis came out of the blue. I was never sick before other than the common flu. Right. And so for me, it really had knocked me off my feet because that was the last thing that I was expecting yeah. uh, was to be diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. Yeah. And what year was it like when you diagnosed with it? Like how, how many years ago? 10 years ago, 2011. 2011. Mm -hmm. Yes. Wow. And how was the actual process like it during that time? Like, obviously, I know it's cancer and that's a painful situation. So how was the, like a process like for going through treatment and everything after you finding out? I'll, I'll walk you back a little bit and yeah. take you through the process first of just getting diagnosed, which mm. was a major feat, it seemed like, in itself. Um, I had went to my primary care doctor a year prior. So All let's right. go back to 2010. And I had a small lump on my neck at the time. And right. I told her, I said, you know, I had this lump on my neck. It's been there for over a week. I'm a little concerned. Yeah. She didn't look at it. She didn't touch it, anything. She said, oh, since you work out so much, it's probably just a pulled muscle. Right. Well, six months, a year later, that did lump did not go away. It actually yeah. had gotten harder and bigger. And so with me trying to navigate life, work, all those other things, mm -hmm. I put it on the back burner. But when the next year came around, it was time for me to have another annual exam. I went to a different doctor. Right. And so I told this doctor, I said, you know, the last doctor I went to didn't seem concerned, but I'm very concerned. This lump is still on my neck. It has actually gotten bigger. Immediately, she touched it, looked at it, asked me a number of questions. Right. So her response was like night and day to the first doctor's response. Yeah. And so I could tell by the look on her face that something wasn't right. Mm -hmm. And so she said, well, what I want you to do, because um, I think she knew, but she didn't want to come out and just diagnose me at that moment because yeah. she didn't have the proof. So she said, what I want you to do is go in for an ultrasound. She scheduled me for an ultrasound. I went in a couple of days later, had the ultrasound, the technician, I could tell again by the look on her face, something yeah. wasn't right. She said, dear, we're gonna have to um, schedule you for a fine needle aspiration. Um, it's inconclusive from the mm -hmm. ultrasound. Went in for a fine needle aspiration. That's where they take a very small t piece of tissue um, from the lymph node. Did that. Still inconclusive because the sample size wasn't enough and they didn't have enough um, cells and all that kind of stuff to make a clear uh, diagnosis. All right. Finally, they said, <laughs> um, what we're going to have to do is a biopsy on your lymph node. So they mm -hmm. took a piece of the lymph node. And after all of that, I got the diagnosis on my way home on a Friday. Um, I got the call that I had been diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. Wow. Yeah. And like once you were diagnosed with the, and like they told you, like, did you go to treatment straight away or like uh, you took some time? How I was, was actually, it like? Sure. I was actually diagnosed on April 8th and right. I actually started treatment about a month later right. um, because I had the cancer for over a year and yeah. didn't know what it was. They didn't want me to wait any longer. Mm -hmm. And so that following Monday after I got the call, 
Um, I started setting up appointments. I got um, connected with a great oncologist and we just started getting things rocking and rolling. Yeah. I started treatment about a month later, as I mentioned, from my diagnosis date, I had a port put in and I went through six months of chemotherapy and a month of radiation and as of today, I'm considered, they don't like to say cured, so yeah. I'll say no evidence of disease as of today. Well, congratulations on that. So it was Thank like you. a long journey. Yes. So I, <laughs> yes. So during the like one year, like before you went again on the second doctor, the whole year you waited. That time, did you not feel any kind of pain or anything or just a lump with that? You know, it was just the lump, but you know, now looking back, yeah, I was I was very fatigued and I attributed that to like stress from work, mm. long hours, all of that. But now when I look back, that was definitely a side effect of the cancer. Yeah. And then also um, closer to when I got the diagnosis, I started having night sweats. Mm -hmm. So later of course and talking to my doctor once I got the diagnosis he was asking me questions yeah um and I was telling him about the night sweats the fatigue he said yes that is actually an indication of Hodgkin's lymphoma including the lump as well yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's just another level so after you found out you've gone for like a treatment and everything when you start doing a treatment is there any kind of pain or yeah to go through you know, actually, yes. Um, I remember my first chemotherapy infusion being painful mm -hmm. in the sense that um, when they put in a port, so when they do the chemotherapy through a port, it goes through your main blood, your main blood vessel. So it goes yeah. to your um, bloodstream immediately. All right. And I just remember having this burning sensation like in my veins, in my arm. And so, and then really being really tired. As time went on from the chemotherapy, it actually affected my lungs. Mm -hmm. So the regimen that I had was A, B, V, D. The um, B, the bleomycin, that actually damaged my lungs. And so uh, halfway through my treatment, that had to be taken out of my chemotherapy regimen. Yeah. Um, and so I was having breathing problems. I developed asthma. And so really fatigue, some bone and joint pain, uh, mouth sores, those were the bulk of my side effects from the chemotherapy. Now the radiation, that was a different story. Uh, many people assume that, you know, because you go in for radiation yeah. five days a week for like 15, 20 minutes, it's easy. Actually, it's not. To me, it was just as hard. <laughs> It's yeah, not it's... harder than the radiate than the chemotherapy, yeah. and uh, the radiation it really knocks you off your feet. Um, I was extremely tired. Mm. Um, I had radiation on my neck area, and so that drastically burned my my skin. Yeah, I, I remember that. Like I used to take my dad a couple of times a week, and he was like a quite different kind of experience when you go for like radiotherapy and everything mm -hmm. so yeah when it comes back from like after doing his radiotherapy is it's so much less painful than comparing to what is but he actually burns that skin and yeah. he get the mark on it and everything so yeah it's like a different kind of approach and mm -hmm. I, I seen that like over and over and coming to the your point like did you actually go through any kind of surgery or taking the lump off or, or didn't need to do that? They didn't fully remove the lymph node. And so um, they did the biopsy. They had to actually um, cut that area and of course take out a bigger piece, but they didn't remove the whole lymph node. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, having the port put in, that was considered surgery as well. So that was the extent of it, of yeah. the surgery. Yeah. So after like you having a chemotherapy and the uh, radiation as well how long it actually took you to get to it's completely gone kind of thing <laughs> i know you mentioned like a 10 years is it actually gone before though or actually took the 10 years you know i would say about 
actually, I started showing improvement um, halfway through my chemotherapy mm. um, because a lot of I had actually started developing um, masses in my lungs and everything else also. Yeah. And so halfway through my chemotherapy, a lot of those masses had shrunk considerably. Right. And so I would say three months after being completely done with treatment, my oncologist felt pretty confident, but he <laughs> didn't want to come out and say it. But yeah. for sure, by the five year mark, it was like, okay, Talia, you're doing really good. I don't, I think you're in the clear. Mm. And so, you know, after all of the treatment though, I can honestly say it took me about two to three years to really feel more like myself. Right. Um, you never feel the same, but I could tell that the wear and tear that the treatment had, you know, put on my body that was starting to turn around. So it takes time. Yeah. And uh, after you going through them, did you have like any support from your family or friends like you're doing going through the situation? Yes, actually, I had support from my family and a couple of friends. My mom was amazing. Um, mm. She was my primary caregiver. And so actually, she um, would get off work whenever yeah. I had to go in for treatment. She went to just about all of my treatments with me. And I would try to have them scheduled like on a Wednesday or a Friday if I could so that she could stay with me a few days and just yeah. make sure that I didn't have any adverse reactions to the treatment. Yeah, that's nice. And is that something like inspired you to become like a, a cancer doula? And that is part of it. The other part is, is that... Um, even though I had support of my family, I had a great oncologist, Yeah, there is just so much coming at you when uh, you are diagnosed with cancer. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, I'm someone that I love to read, I love to research and do all these things. But for people that don't enjoy that, it can be very overwhelming. Yeah, And so what I was missing from my cancer journey was having that person I could talk to who had been through something similar. And so I said, you know, there's a couple things that I wish I would have had. And I'm sure I'm not the only person. So really, that's what prompted me to um, become a cancer doula. Yeah, it's nice. So when did you form your company uh, on the other side? Yes, I'll tell you that story. So um, after my cancer treatment, I ended up going back to work Yeah. Um, for six months. And then I quit and then i found another job later mm. and worked that job until 2018 and in the process i started taking um, a coaching certification course right so when that course was over um and at the end of 2018 i left my corporate job and went to the very next day went to orlando florida and got my certification and then i started my company in 2018 but officially yeah. started like hitting the ground running in 2019. That's nice, yeah. And like uh, just before lockdown and coronavirus, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. So I was able to make some connections and kind of get the ball rolling. And then 2020 kind of put everything to a halt and I had to readjust <laughs> like everyone else. Yeah, like I, I never heard of like uh, being a, a cancer doula is something new to me, honestly. And especially in a normal child, like uh, someone helps through their pregnancy journey and things. Mm -hmm. But cancer doula is something new to me. So tell me more about like uh, what is really motivated to become mm -hmm. one and find your purpose to helping other cancer, cancer patients. Absolutely. So first, if you don't mind, because I hear that all the time, a lot of people heard, never heard of a cancer doula. Yeah. So if it's okay with you, I'd just like to break that down for you sure. and the audience. Yeah, sure. Um, actually, I started out calling myself a cancer coach. Okay. And as you know, there's coaches, all kinds of coaches. Yeah. But that word coach just didn't seem to really resonate with me and fit what I felt like I was doing or mm. I am doing. So I had her of a doula. 
I knew what doulas did as far as, you know, helping women give birth and walking them through that whole process. Yeah. And I really researched the word. And the word doula means to help someone through a major life change or a significant health-related experience. Mm -hmm. I said, ah, that is definitely cancer. And so, of course, a birth doula is really helps someone to bring life into the world. So that's the beginning. There's also a death doula that's helping someone transition. So that's the end. And I, I'm right in the middle as a cancer doula. So what I do is I help people focus on the present mm-hmm. and really hone in on how they can get over and uh, work through this challenge that's in front of them that's called cancer so that they can move on, have a healthier life, have a better quality of life. Yeah. And um, that's my meaning of a cancer doula. Yeah, it's nice. Thank you for like breaking it down. Mm-hmm. And like, uh, going back to my question, which is like, how did you get into the kind of like a job or like uh, the career you path? Did you actually knew beforehand, like that kind of thing existed or you had to research and figure it out yourself? You know, I researched it and figured it out myself. And in the process of doing my research, I had only found like three other Right. People that were cancer coaches is what they wow. called themselves. And I had reached out to all three of them. And one only one lady responded. She was very kind. Mm. And she kind of told me what she was doing, how things had been going for her, the ups, the downs, all of that. And so in addition to having her to talk to and yeah. see how it was working out for her, I really did my own research as well, as far as um, what are the things, additional things that people that have been diagnosed with cancer, what are they needing? Mm. What are they struggling with? And also thinking about the caregiver, their family, you know, what are they struggling with? And a lot of times it's that communication, it's understanding the treatment options that have been explained to them by their, their oncologist or healthcare team. It's their mindset, you know, of course, something like cancer can be very depressing, cause a lot of anxiety. And so unfortunately, that's a natural reaction, but unfortunately some people get stuck there. And that is not something that we want because that can actually suppress their immune system even more and stagnate their healing. Mm. And so just learning and using the tools that helped me on my cancer journey that's really how I got started. Yeah, it's nice. And yeah, I want to like ask you one question, which is going to be when you diagnosed with the cancer and everything going through all of the medication and treatment, how is your mental health like that time? Did you, you have know, to go through like ups and down or like you convince your brain like whatever happened and just move forward? How How is the mindset? You know, I'm going to take you back to my diagnosis because there was one thing that I had done at that time. I had no idea what I was doing. I just did what I felt I needed Mm. to do and what felt right. So that Friday when I got my diagnosis, um, I actually called my family when I got home. I let them know. And I I said, you know, I don't have any answers for you right now. I, I just need some time to myself. So I took that whole weekend and right. I cried, I prayed, I got all of that out. Yeah. And thankfully, my family gave me that space to do that. Because that Monday, I was able to kind of kick things in gear and do what I needed to do. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, there was fear and everything else involved. But what really led me was my will to live. Yeah. So I couldn't let the fear, I couldn't let the anxiety and depression and all of that take over because then I wouldn't be able to take action. And so I had to let my will to live lead me through all of that. And of course, you know, there were times of uncertainty and not feeling well, and then that can lead to depression and whatnot. Yeah. And um, where I received treatment, there was a social worker there. I did um, attempt to go to one um, support group, but it wasn't Mm. the right fit for me. They happened to be all older people, and it was just a negative environment. 
So yeah. that's where learning about mind body connection and learning how to, in a sense, control the mind and, and all of that, that's when all of that learning kicked in for me. Um, and I'm not going to sit here and say every day was perfect. It wasn't. Yeah. But one thing that I learned how to do was, okay, acknowledge that emotion, feel that emotion, mm. let it go, because you still have living to do. You still have to get through this treatment. And so that's how so, I managed. Yeah. So instead of like you focusing on a negative side, you just focus on the positive side of it, right? Mm -hmm. I yeah. did. I, I focused on the positive side. And you know what else? really drove me was like, you know, this is happening for a reason. That means mm. there's some changes I need to make in my life. Now that, you know, I am off of work due to cancer. Yeah. Let me take this time to just calm my mind and think about what's not working for me. What doesn't yeah. feel right. And so being able to just be still and think about those things helped me to realize the areas in my life where I needed to make changes. That mm. was that corporate job. Not to say there's anything wrong with that. There isn't. But that was part of what contributed to a major amount of stress that I was carrying. Um, and, you know, just re relationships with, you know, friends and things like that, that were not the healthiest relationships that I should have probably let go years ago. But because we're friends, I held on yeah. to it. And so it forced me to just look at every area of my life and say, what other areas need healing besides my body? Yeah. So you improved those areas and found a, a purpose for uh, to live, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I had always wondered what my purpose was. Mm -hmm. And I, I was always a helper. So I yeah. knew that I was supposed to be doing something helping people. I just didn't know what that was. Yeah. And I always tell people my purpose found me. <laughs> <laughs> Cancer showed up and found me. <laughs> so Yeah. And it kind of led me to what I it led me to what I'm doing today. So Yeah. And, and did you was any kind of relationship that time when you got diagnosed with the cancer? I was single at the time, thankfully, right. because I've heard horror stories, you know, even in the some of the people that I support, you know, their mm. marriages are impacted. Um, you know, if they were having problems prior to a cancer diagnosis, yeah. that puts even more strain on the relationship. So I was not um, in a relationship at that time. And I think <laughs> in some ways it might have been um, a little better because I just wouldn't have had that. I didn't have that piece to yeah. um, focus on. Yeah, it depends, isn't it? Like what kind of relationship you have. If you have a strong relationship, then this is the best thing you ever could happen. And mm -hmm. if it's like a toxic relationship, then the worst thing you can actually have during the time like you're going through and someone's not supporting you, it's going to hurt you so much. Like why I want to live for, right? Most people yeah. I see, they come to like, oh, my spouse doesn't even care and everything. Why I want to mm -hmm. fight through the cancer? Why I need to survive because I don't see anything. The bright future, there is nothing to look forward. So why mm -hmm. if someone comes to you like when like a client or like a cancer patient when you help what do you do you know what's the process like mm -hmm. so the first thing that i do is i have a 30 minute call with them yeah. and i call this um, a meet and greet because really that's what it is it's for uh, me to learn about what the potential clients challenges are yeah. and see what areas they need support in and then in talking to them and learning more about them, I am able to say, hey, yes, I can help you or no, mm. I can't. If it's something that I feel is outside of my area of expertise, then I'll try to find someone in my network to refer them to. Right. And so that's pretty much how that process works. There is a, a questionnaire that they fill out prior to the call and they answer some questions about, you know, their diagnosis and all of that yeah. and the challenges. We have a call, talk about those challenges. I present how I can help them um, if possible. Mm -hmm. And um, then I say, hey, you know, do you feel like it's a good fit? 
And if it is, we take it from there and we start the process. And if not, as I mentioned, I um, send them or refer them to someone else if, if I can. Yeah. And does it have to be like a physical or do it virtually or you have to be with them physical place? Great question. You know, prior to COVID, I had an option where um, I would meet them in person, like at their doctor's appointments and things like that, mm. if they wanted me to do that. But now everything is virtual. So everything's on Zoom or over the phone. And there's still that option if they like for me to accompany them to their appointments. It's yeah. just video. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So it's mostly like about helping them through their mindset and also like are you directing through them like what the steps needs to be doing if they in a doubt to ask certain question to the doctor or something then you help them through like asking that question right absolutely so think of it as you know having someone to walk with you on your cancer journey mm. and this person is your guide so i'm their guide yeah. and i don't know everything about cancer, but there are certain key things that typically happen in each person's cancer journey. And yeah. so being able to guide them, I help them to navigate the healthcare system. You know, for me, that was something I had to learn because besides my annual exams, I didn't have to go to the doctor much. So yeah. learning about insurance and filing claims and what to do when a claim is denied. Mm. Um, so the, there's four key areas that I say I like to cover. One of them, as we mentioned, is mindset yeah. and emotional support. So emotional support is really being there like a mentor for them. Allow, give them that space to talk and vent and not judge them. And, yeah. But then let them know that their feelings are valid. So that's the first piece. The second piece is health. And that includes mm -hmm. nutrition, exercise, making sure that they are taking care of themselves to the best of their ability. Yeah. Um, the third piece is understanding their treatment options and right. also working closely with their doctor and understanding that, hey, you can advocate for yourself. I'm here to advocate for you as well, mm -hmm. but you have to show up. You have to form a partnership with your oncologist and healthcare team. So giving them those tools, helping them to understand the doctor speak sometimes that um, us as normal, you know, people, yeah. we may not know if we haven't gone to medical school. So taking that stress of, off of them. Also, if they want to learn about other integrative care and other um, clinical trials or whatever, I do that research for them as well by going to credible resources and um, presenting that information to them. The fourth piece is communication. Mm -hmm. That could be, as we mentioned, communication with your spouse, your family, your job. Yeah. Talking about cancer is very uncomfortable for a lot of people. And so a lot of um, people don't know how to talk to someone with cancer. So they may say these weird, awkward things, not because they're trying to be hurtful. Yeah. They're nervous. They just don't know what to say. So putting those tools in the hands of a cancer patient so that they don't have to feel uncomfortable. They can kind of control the conversation mm. and share what they want to share. And so those are the main things in addition to helping them navigate the healthcare system, finding resources, and then also understanding insurance and even yeah. making space for the loved ones in their lives that may need support too. Yeah, it's nice. So, and how, how long like do, do you actually work with a cancer patient? Do, is there like a throughout the whole treatment or like is there any? certain like a six weeks or eight weeks kind of thing? You know, it's really up to them and how much support they need. But I will share with you that I do have different options because everyone's mm. situation is different. So yeah. someone can come to me, say one time, and they have this challenge in front of them. Yeah. And we'll meet for an hour. That's one session. That's fine. They can come back to me later if they want. I also have a package that is for one month. 
So we would meet four times throughout that one month. And then I have a three month package as well. So I try to be flexible yeah. because people have different needs throughout their cancer journey. Yeah, interesting. And do you work with this someone like an ongoing basis, like uh, throughout the whole process? Some people mm -hmm. takes like a year, isn't it? Yes, yes. And, you know, I don't create a specific like a yearly package yeah. because people may look at that and say, well, I don't even know if I'll live for a year. <laughs> yeah. And so it may be hard for them to commit to that up front. Mm. But at times, you know, there has been a situation where it did go for almost a year. And it was, af you know, after they started their treatment through survivorship, to through when they finish their treatment, because that's something else. Yeah. You know, that it doesn't stop when the treatment's done. It's a different challenge now. And so that's part of the cancer continuum. Interesting. Thank you for sharing like uh, your process to work with uh, cancer patients. So I'm interested to know, like, how do you find those people? Do you have to go through like a hospital or something or just a bit locally? You know, I'm going to be totally honest. When I first started this, um, I was very eager to connect with hospitals and clinics. However, mm -hmm. they weren't very receptive. Yeah. You know, their response was, well, we have our patient navigators, we have our social workers and that kind of thing. And then also um, a lot of them are very strict on certain verbiage yeah. and all of those things. So that was something I really wanted to do was connect with hospitals and clinics, but that didn't go my way. Mm. So what I started doing was um, connecting with cancer nonprofits, um, talking to other people that are in the health and wellness space and forming partnerships with them. So really, a lot of my clients are by word of mouth or if I go and do a talk somewhere and then that's how they learn about me. Um, so it's it's one of those things where, too, it's not covered by insurance. Yeah. And so that's another barrier for people. But I think one of the misconceptions is that um, I'm in competition with mm. the patient navigator or the social worker. No, I'm not. I am complimentary to all of that support and care that the patient gets at the hospital. Yeah. The, the only thing is I'm focused specifically on that patient, making sure that client, making sure that they get the personalized care, resources, and information that they need. And then we have a relationship we have an ongoing relationship yeah. and so really it's an additional i'm an additional resource for the client slash patient i don't replace anyone on their healthcare team yeah you just do addition to uh, make it simpler for everyone mm -hmm. so wherever you learned uh last 10 years you're just putting it through you know just one course or one session where people mm -hmm. can take it and get advantage from it right so you don't That's have to right. juggle through and get information from google or youtube and things like that and yes. um, also you have someone to talk about like how you went through how is your mindset like and everything that m makes it easier for someone and calms them down right this That's is why right. the podcast is all about if the, anyone listening is got cancer or things like that then they can get inspired right you make mm -hmm. it through like after battling for like 10 years and mm -hmm. right now came clean and yeah, you're helping other people. So people get mm -hmm. motivation from that. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. And I'm so glad that you get it. And I think, and you tell me it might be because you had to go through it with your father. Yeah. Um, is that why it was easier for you to kind of understand? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I was 11 years old uh, when he diagnosed with the cancer and he had the lung cancer. Mm -hmm. So he was in a last stage kind of thing, like a stage three in that mm -hmm. time. And yeah, it's like holding his chest like this all the time and going through like pain. He used to scream in the nighttime because mm -hmm. of the pain. And till I was like 25 years old, after he passed away till about uh, 11 12 years till i could hear like sometime i wake up like a jumping out of my bed uh, yeah. thinking he's screaming with the pain 
because mm-hmm. I used to sleep in the same room. We had two separate bed uh, because I have to give him medication if the pain is too excessive. So mm-hmm. there is a patches you have to put through on your lungs. So that gives a pain really for, I think, six hours. Yeah, around six hours is last. And he had like a different sorts of medication about three times a day. So mm-hmm. there was no kind of like a nurse or someone we can hire that time. So only person was like me. My mom was there, but she wasn't that educated, giving him mm-hmm. a medication. And also she was a very soft person in terms yeah. of like seeing someone in a pain and going through. So yeah, I had to learn and adapt and everything. And I, I remember I caught my anxiety since then because he's screaming and everything. Yes. He was 56 years old, 57 years old at that time. Wow. So it wasn't easy. And he was like a very angry person all the time mm-hmm. and I used to get scared of him while he got cancer he started getting uh, like a proper calm person like yeah one is just before he passed away about six months before the he just gone calm down but in the beginning of his cancer he wasn't easy he had the kind of like angry person shouting screaming and everything so even the normal person shout at you and you're 11 years old, you're going to start crying, right? Exactly. And especially you're doing a job, like you have to give him medication and everything. It wasn't like easy process. Also, I went with him like a different, different hospital for different treatment. Some of them chemotherapy, some of the radiation, some of them like uh, uh, testing his blood samples and everything. So every month we have to go for like a different, different hospital. And the hospital wasn't is nearby. It was like... Mm four hours drive five hours drive from our uh, town where we live in and yeah sometimes he used to go through certain pain and everything i used to call the local doctor three in the morning four in the morning and the pain and his screaming and everything wasn't easy the whole house and everything so since he got cancer till the day he passed away about one one year six seven months that time so one and six, seven months, it was like a roller coaster journey for me, my mom, mm-hmm. and one of my sister. It's like sometimes feel like it's gonna cure and everything. Sometimes it's like it's getting worse, yeah. and the whole house, no, no one can actually smile or laugh. You know, like mm-hmm. the joy wasn't there because one person is critically ill and you can't just really do that. Also, same time there's a the pressure was I'm homeschooled, so I have to look for my grade as well, my carrying my study. Also, he had multiple businesses. I have to look I look after them businesses at that time. He actually opened me a business account when I was uh, 11 years old. Yeah. And it's, it's just a, like a different things. He knew he's not going to make it. So he gave me all of his knowledge and experiences. Like after when the sunset happens about 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. From there till like midnight, we used to talk six, seven hours straight and he used to tell me his stories. And he had a mm-hmm. rest- he has been a restaurant owner for 40, 45 years. And he used to talk to different, different people. The guest used to come to the restaurant. So mm-hmm. everyone's journey, everyone's stories. And so he used to tell me every p- single person like what mistake they did in their life, how hard uh, they worked through their life and everything. So certain mistake I shouldn't do. He never said like, uh, don't smoke to mm-hmm. me because even <laughs> though he got the cancer from smoking he never wanted to like control me he just gave me the way like look what happened to me with having a smoke a cigarette and everything so mm-hmm. it's up to you whatever you do like you looking at it so i promised myself i'm never gonna smoke and i never smoked in my life even though i went to depression and anxiety and everything mm-hmm. so yeah so he has like a unique way of teaching someone he tell you a story in a way and then you need to decide what you want to do either you want to go right path or wrong path the choice is yours but he never pressurized even though it's my education like uh, most parents from bangladesh india they always pressurize or you have to have uh, become a doctor lawyer engineer something he only one told me one thing like i never got proper education he was only in primary school he never been to middle school or anything so He told me only thing he, I want for me, like get educated, proper educated, get some kind of degree and everything. You can be even though school teacher, I don't mind. As long as you get certain education and do whatever you need to do as a professional way. You either could be a doctor and don't charge money to anyone. You can give like a free medication and free treatment. 
and you can do like here manage my businesses because he had mm -hmm. like multiple businesses so you can manage and learn businesses so he's teaching me business how to do business how to manage team and everything so i learned that on an early age and wow. only thing helped me with this his he shared me the experience and knowledge of his and that was a great journey and at the same time like i said going through cancer journey is not easy mm -hmm. uh, someone who's going through like uh, their family members parents or spouse or even the child it's, it's really really hard for even the person who's with you rather than like a cancer patient themselves and yeah it's, it's really really tough times for both parties either mm -hmm. your relative the person next to you and the cancer patient itself and we both have to be strong you know like what can you do there's a certain yeah. things you can't control some That's people great will make it some people will not make it and end of the day we all have to go right so True. yeah you have to fight through like you do you probably have a cancer and i can die tomorrow and you can live another 20 years 30 years <laughs> we have really, exactly. we have no guarantee on that that's uh, so true yeah some people like can never smoke never drink they got lung cancer and it just kind of fascinating isn't it, it <laughs> like it how happened. that happened yeah yeah, yeah, that's one thing I said. I said, you know, I'm around so many people that smoke and drink and mm. do these things. And here I am trying to live a very healthy life. And I'm the one <laughs> that yeah. gets cancer. I mean, you have those kinds of questions. It's like, what in the world? But when you have those questions like that, and you have those situations, to me, I feel like that's a way to get you to open your eyes. Yeah absolutely and look at what you're doing are you living your life to the fullest are you fulfilling mm. your purpose all those very meaningful questions it's time to start asking and getting answers for those questions when things like that happen and that's kind of how I looked at it. I'm like well this is a sign that it's time for me to really get to the root of what I am here to do yeah, so true. And also, like, rather than blaming others, God, and everyone around you, you just accept it, you know. Mm -hmm. Without accepting it, you can't really do much about it. When you diagnose with the cancer, what's the point of blaming God? What's the uh, point of blaming someone else? What's the point of blaming even though you've had some bad habit? You just need to accept it and focus on the present moment. What difference I can make, even though I have, like, a few years to live, a few months to live, I don't know what stage on, on mm -hmm. people and be optimistic on the same time, uh, stay ready for like, what's the worst case scenario. And right. we all have to be like optimistic. We, every morning we wake up every, every night we go to bed thinking mm -hmm. next morning I'm going to wake up. So <laughs> yeah, there is a hope, right? And we don't know That's if we right. control it or not. Sometimes the house can be on a fire. A lot of people die in their sleep. Uh, there mm -hmm. is so many things going on that could be a tornado or like an earthquake or, or so many ways people can die, right? That's right. But we have and the, yeah, like optimistic thing, like a tomorrow morning I'm going to wake up, I'm going to do my job, I'm going to do something. So why don't mm -hmm. you take it like a, even though you have a cancer, even though you're going through tough times, just think, yeah, I'm going to give it a best shot. Even though I wake up tomorrow morning, I'll live my fullest. I'll try my best. The pain That's is right. there. The suffering is there. It's going to be there. It's one in another way. Everyone's going through some kind of pain. Some is like a That's physical, so some is a mental. But it depends like how you react to it. Absolutely. Um, life is the journey, isn't it? It is. It is. And, you know, you, you said so much there, but it to me it really came down to focus to lay on what you can't control and that isn't cancer yeah. it's yeah. how you respond to what is happening that's all that i could control mm -hmm. that's it so why fight with it you yeah. know just figure out and focus on what i could do to yeah. better myself and not make things worse <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so true yeah and thank you so much uh talia for like inspiring others with your journey i really appreciate it and also you're doing amazing work with your company on the other side helping other cancer patients 
So we are running out of time for this podcast episode. So those who are listening, if anyone wants to reach out or learn more about your work and your company, how they can find you out. Yes. First of all, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Most and um, I appreciate you sharing your platform. People can find me at ontheotherside.life. That is my website. So again, that's ontheotherside.life. I'm also on Instagram and that's on the other side one seven. And then also if they go to my website, they'll see um, links to my social media accounts as well. And they can find me there. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so thank much you. for sharing your platform as well. So I wish you good luck with your company. I wish you good luck with your life as well. And hope that cancer doesn't come back again and you live your life fullest till remaining life you have and continuously impact other people's life. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, that and I receive those well wishes and I wish you the best. Keep doing what you're doing. Much health and happiness to you and your family. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. So that's the wrap, guys. Thank you so much for listening. So you know how to find Talaya. Go to her website and check her stuff out. If you, anyone need a consultation or help from Talaya, ask for the help. So yeah, till then, stay safe, stay healthy, and talk to you in the next episode. Take care.